Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. Thank you very much for coming. This is a rainy day, uh, and you know that it's particularly hard to uh, move around the city, but it's so important for us to be here. This is our very first health cohort here at Halcyon. There's There's been a lot of changes. Um, I like to say that, you know, so, some people say that if, if it ain't broke, uh, don't fix it. I, I don't like that. I think that we should be fixing things, even if they're not broken all the time, just to make sure that they are the best that they can be. Uh, speaking of the best that they can be, we're so excited to uh, showcase the work that we've been doing with this uh, eight ventures uh, of the best health fellows that we can find uh, and that are out there. Um, I'm not going to speak too long because we have a lot of interesting things to, to share with you. So once again, thank you. I want to thank our partners and sponsors, um, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, sorry, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, um, AWS, thank you very much, uh, Deloitte, and all these other amazing friends that we have here, our board and honorary board. Thank you very much for all of your support, the Halcyon team. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the fellows because you also chose us when you applied and trusted us to, to help you grow your vision and, uh, and really accelerate the impact driven future of businesses. Thank you very much. To get us started, I'm going to invite you to stage Fred Ten from Hewlett Parker Enterprise to deliver uh, some welcome remarks. He's the head of global social impact at HPE. Uh, so let's put our hands together for Fred. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcelo, for the kind uh, introduction, um, Dan and Kim, for your friendship and uh, the rest of the Halcyon team for uh, the great partnership that we enjoy. And to all the innovators, leaders, uh, it's my privilege to be able to share this time with you. So thank you for letting me be here with you. Um, like Marcelo said, um, I'm with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. The Hewlett Packard that you know, um, it's split in 2015. Um, and so on one hand, you have the side HP Inc. that produces your laptops. How many of you have an HP laptop? I hope it is good. If it's not, it's not me. Um, I'm on Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We are an edge to cloud company. We work in data and AI, high performance computing, supercomputing, hybrid cloud. Um, it's a technology that powers innovation, that enables cutting edge life science research. Um, and, um, and we feel really strongly that a thriving um, ecosystem requires support of the innovators um, at different levels. And, and that's why we're thrilled to, to support this program. Um, even though Hewlett Packard Enterprise is only eight years old as a company, our, our roots trace back to 1939 when Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard started the company in Bill's garage. If you go to the Bay Area, you can visit the garage. Um, in that garage, by a toss of a coin, they decided the name of the company. And so it's Hewlett Packard Company. Um, and their first product was an audio oscillator. Um, and their first customer was Walt Disney, who purchased it to produce Fantasia. Um, they started the company with $538 and two employees. Um, for me, a couple of lessons that I take away from their story and the legacy of this company. One, please don't name your company based off a coin toss or, or maybe do because it worked out fine for them. Um, second is that innovation starts small. And the third is that relationships matter. Uh, Walt Disney was our first customer. They remain our customer and was one of our biggest um, partners to date. Um, the relationships you build as a team is so key. Um, and in the work that you're doing um, to advance healthcare, uh, you, it's a it's a grand challenge. 4.5 billion people without uh, effective and adequate healthcare, uh, rising costs, decreasing trust in institutions. Uh, it is a tall order, but these are the business context. And um, my personal belief is that um, change is a business context, but it requires sometimes an emotional solution. Um, and we need to, to take care of both. Um, and the emotional solution maybe in healthcare should cover things like 
ensuring that the technologies we use are ethical, responsible, that the use of artificial intelligence is used responsibly without bias, that it's built sustainably um, because artificial intelligence takes a lot of energy. Um, but there's so much potential in the space that you're working in to leverage technology to drive great advancements and to advance the way that people live. Um, and I am really inspired by all of you and, and the solutions that you're working on, um, whether it's to improve um, care options for the LGBTQ plus community, flattening the healthcare curse, uh, cost, not curse, um, whether it's improving diagnosis or um, improving treatment options. I, I am so personally grateful for, for all that you're doing. So thank you. Um, I want to end with a quote from one of my favorite authors and to tie it all back to relationships. Um, the author is Dan Heath and the book is called Upstream. And there's one line in there that always sticks out to me. And he says, you cannot help a thousand people or a million people unless you learn how to help the one. And in your journey to be a multi-million, multi-billion dollar enterprise, um, I hope that we will always remember to understand the one uh, whose lives are infinitely changed because of the solutions you're driving. So again, thank you for the inspiring work that you do. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to share this time and to share this journey with you. Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to Marcelo. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, and now for uh, a very special moment, I would like to invite Dr. Ainsley McLean uh, in our board, who just hosted us a couple of days ago um, at, uh, at Kaiser Permanente, where we had a very insightful, uh, interesting visit to your facilities. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for coming here again to, to talk to our guests. Um, and Dr. Peggy Hamburg, former commissioner of the US Food and Drug Administration, for a fireside chat. Thank you very much. Welcome to the stage. So full disclosure, my hair does not normally look like this. This is like a humid induced, uh, and yours looks impeccable. I don't know how you've just crossed the world. So um, it's so wonderful to be with you all. It was incredible to see the fellows you'll get to hear from in action. And we're just so lucky to have Dr. Hamburg here with us with such significant experience. Um, so I'll start out with a question. Just given your tremendous journey, um, you know, through a lot of the public sector, what role do you feel the private sector plays in really contributing to innovation and influencing um, equitable healthcare? Well, I think it's really critical to recognize that innovation involves an ecosystem. And as our, our uh, last speaker observed, partnership. So it really does require people working together towards a common set of goals, recognizing shared problems and challenges and identifying pathways forward. And I, I find that the work that's being done here at Halcyon is so critical because it's really building the next generation of individuals who are coming to it already with that sense of the importance of partnership and the sense of not just doing new things mm -hmm. or advancing science and technology, but doing it in a way that can be harnessed to really address critical unmet needs in um, medicine, public health and health care. And that's what's guided my career. And um, I welcome it in uh, the next generation, I must say. And I think you can start from any one of a number of places, in government, in public service, in academia, or in the private sector. But I think you will not be successful in the modern era unless you understand the importance of partnership, the importance of collaboration, the importance of working across disciplines and sectors and borders. That's such a great answer. Um, and when you look at innovation, and I'm, I'm sure through your distinguished career as well, there may have been obstacles that 
kind of came in your way. What advice do you have for all of us in this room who may confront challenges when we're trying to innovate? Well, I think you have to believe in what you're doing, but you also have to listen and learn. Um, I think that there are so many opportunities before us that can also be overwhelming. And so you have to, to set priorities and that can be hard. And there, I think you have to rely on both your gut intuition, both what, what you're passionate about and want to put time and effort into pursuing because success always requires hard work. It doesn't just happen. Um, but I think it 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 also uh, requires a recognition that you know, as you know, already has been noted, you can't do things alone. People say if you if you you know really want to get something uh, done, you need to do it um, in collaboration. You need to identify what are the components of the problem that have to be solved and who is best equipped uh, to help with that. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that at the end of the day, the hardest thing is having confidence in yourself. Um, uh, I think we all suffer a bit from imposter syndrome. I at least know that I do. And sometimes I've, I have felt this this is really just beyond my pay grade. This is such an immense challenge. Can I really take it uh, forward? And then, you know, the key is, you know, just to put one foot in front of the other and, and keep going and um, and understand, you know, what your North Star is. I love that you mentioned imposter syndrome. I heard recently that, and this is something we say in tech a lot, but I think it's particularly apropos to AI is we all have a component of imposter syndrome because you can never keep up, right? You can never know enough. So along the lines of AI, I have a really easy question for you. Um, what role do you think regulation should and maybe will play when it comes to artificial intelligence? And how does that differ from other technology or medical devices? Well, AI is probably more complex um, and it's unfolding so rapidly that it creates all kinds of challenges for regulation. But I don't think it's it's that different than other emerging technologies and advances uh, in science in terms of the the important role that regulation can play. You know, I, I, I know from hard experience that many people see regulation as a barrier to progress. Um, but in fact, regulation that's done wisely and and done in collaboration with the innovators mm -hmm. and the ultimate users actually, I think, accelerates meaningful innovation and progress towards successful products that will really make a difference for people. And I think that whether it's artificial intelligence or it's any other area of emerging science and technology, the regulators can be most effective if they're working with this broader community, with this ecosystem, whether it's the people doing the fundamental research, the applied research, um, the people who are funding the research, uh, the payers, and ultimately including the users as well, understanding all of the perspectives, but trying to shape a system that can assess risks but also assess benefits and provide the balance of the risks and benefits to ultimately uh, serve the public. Now, I think AI creates a situation where we're never going to be able to get ahead of where the science and technology is. And we have to be very, very careful not to try to over-regulate um, because we just don't have enough information at the present time about where the opportunities are and where the problems are. And we don't have, in all honesty, an, enough tools 
to control aspects of the ongoing innovation, the development. So I think responsible stewardship mm -hmm. is really where we need to be headed. And we need to, to be working very, very hard to understand all of the many different applications and very, very sensitive to the potential misapplications, where things are going wrong. And it, there is no government regulation. This has to be, I mean, there, there needs to be elements of government regulation, but the government is not the ultimate arbiter. I don't think that will never work. That will create either barriers or laissez-faire. I think it has to be a system of responsible oversight and stewardship at every level from the people that are developing the systems, the people that are using the systems, um, the people that are paying for the systems, and the end users all, you know, working together to manage what is an incredibly powerful and important technology, but one that we recognize, you know, can certainly be either deliberately or inadvertently misapplied and do harm. And once again, gets back to that spirit of collaboration. It really is taking everyone around the table, as you said. Okay, so one closing question for you. Um, what advice do you have for this illustrious crew um, as you look to the next five years in terms of um, where you hope innovation will take us as, as you know, entrepreneurs like these, this team really shape that future for us? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, one thing to always remember is that innovation for innovation's sake can be cool and fun, but innovation really matters when it makes a difference in people's lives. So I think it's it's really crucial to be thinking about how you're going to harness the advances in science and technology to make a difference for people in need, to address the critical challenges before us, uh, to really make sure that we're aligning the opportunities in science and technology with these critical unmet needs and the grand challenges uh, before us. And, and I think it's incredibly exciting but it is a sense of responsibility that um, you need to really be thinking about not just sort of what you can do, but will it matter to people? I love that. A guiding beacon. As we say at Kaiser Permanente, we keep the patient at the center of all of the innovation right. and our physicians. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamburg. I learned so much from this conversation and um, I really, really appreciate it. And Hopefully our audience did as well. So thank you. Thank well, you thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be exposed. To be and project my voice as well. Um, <laughs> no problem. Uh, thank you. This was very inspiring. And to continue this inspiring spirit now for our fellows. Uh, as I mentioned, we had eight ventures in this cohort. This is our very first uh, health-focused cohort, and we're, we couldn't be happier. Uh, I thanked a lot of people before. Uh, I just wanted to also take a moment to uh, say thank you to a very special person, uh, our new president and CEO, Dan Barker. Uh, who's been in the position since the beginning of 2024, if we could put our hands together for him. <clears throat> I know that he appreciates a lot the attention. Um, <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I would like to invite on stage our very first entrepreneur. Um, he is a person that you definitely should go talk after to learn more about what he's doing. Uh, and also if you have, uh, if you want to, you know, get tips on a great playlist for uh, everything, you know, if you like music and you want to get some tips, uh, ask Justin Ayers from Equality MD after. Okay. Uh, welcome to the stage, Justin. Thank you. First to go, no pressure. Welcome to the Halcyon Showcase for their inaugural healthcare class. 
I'm honored and humbled to share this stage with healthcare luminaries and visionary entrepreneurs like the one sitting over here. So let's get this party started. I'm Justin Ayers. I'm a former health care trial lawyer. Please don't hold that against me. And I'm now a health tech entrepreneur. And I'm the founder and CEO of Equality MD. And we're changing how the underserved LGBTQ community perceives and receives care. I will say being here at Halcyon is was uh, it's been it's been quite a privilege. It's the only residential fellowship program that I know of. I actually turned this place down last spring. I thought they would never forgive me for that, but I did that so that I, my team and I could participate in the Cedar Sinai Accelerator in Los Angeles, which was phenomenal. And somehow they decided to do a healthcare cohort, and I thought now they're speaking my language. And so I, I applied and they gracefully accepted my application. And this eight weeks has gone by in a second, but it's also seemed like a year. Uh, we've made so many friends and, and, and I think these are friends I'm gonna have for life. So as I was saying, I'm a former healthcare trial lawyer turned health tech entrepreneur and the founder and CEO of Equality MD, where we're changing how the LGBTQ community perceives and receives healthcare. This was me several years ago at my dermatologist's office in Washington, DC. I was going in for an exam and I had to put on one of those awful hospital gowns that no one likes to wear. When the doctor was about to begin the exam, I came out to him as gay. He said he couldn't complete the exam because he didn't feel comfortable touching my skin. He left the room, leaving me feeling alone and less than human. Sadly, my experience is not uncommon. One in three LGBTQ Americans experience discrimination in a clinical setting, causing one in four to avoid care altogether. One in six are denied care, as I was, and one in eight live in states where providers can legally deny care. One in five experience discrimination from payers, and a shocking 58% are uninsured or underinsured. Systemic discrimination in our healthcare system has created massive data gaps in healthcare inequities. And these data gaps create a cycle of decreased patient engagement and worse patient outcomes. Notably, our community represents every other demographic from racial minorities to military veterans. Our solution is an LGBTQ inclusive virtual first healthcare and data analytics platform. Our provider network is required to undergo evidence-based cultural competency training. Our AI matching algorithm connects patients with providers based on each patient's intersectionality of identities. And we transform new patient journey data into actionable insights. Our AI-driven platform delivers value-based care and new insights. Patients sign up for Equality MD, then they have an inclusive intake form and are matched with a provider. They can then schedule either in-person or virtual appointments, manage the medications, and even get reimbursed by their provider. Importantly, throughout this entire patient journey, we collect new data. The types of new data we're collecting include sexual orientation and gender identity, social determinants of health, as well as consumer behavioral data. RAI transforms this data into actionable insights and new clinical tools. We're creating personalized patient experiences. We're generating predictive analytics. And I think this is really cool. We're building a novel LGBTQ GPT for payers as well as clinicians so they can create a culturally competent and safe space when they treat LGBTQ patients. Our unique insights will help health systems, payers, and corporations increase patient engagement, improve patient outcomes, and authentically engage new markets. Our existing tech architecture is going to be serving as the foundation for this new platform. We've already connected patients with providers and patients love the fact that they could finally be their authentic selves and providers were ecstatic that we drove new patients to them that they never could have found on their own. We're building this new health tech platform in two phases. I'm excited to announce that just today we launched our, end, our product, initial product with our telehealth partner and we're going to be growing that over the next two years and in time, taking those patients and moving them to our main health tech platform 
which we're continuing to build simultaneously. Our go-to-market telehealth solution is a way for us to fuel and fund the main platform. We're able to leverage our telehealth partners, tech infrastructure, and physician networks. In so doing, we're saving time and money, building brand awareness, and also generating quick revenue, all while serving an immediate LGBTQ healthcare need. Imagine that the telehealth product that we're launching just today with our partner is the booster rocket that takes our main platform into orbit. So we launch with them, migrate patients to our main platform, and then scale our virtual first system. We have a cash pay model that is affordable and allows patients to have up to 36 healthcare visits every year and access to over a thousand medications. This cash pay model is ideal for those who are uninsured or underinsured. We pay our telehealth partner only $15 per patient per month. This incredible deal allows us to generate rapid monthly recurring revenue, which in turn helps fund our main platform. We're an early player in the $216 billion LGBTQ healthcare market. And this is growing as younger generations are increasingly coming out. I have a 12 year enduring relationship with the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce. They have 53 chapters across the nation and over 7 million members. They will be a channel partner of ours to help create a repeatable flywheel at scale. So each chapter will be able to promote our products throughout their communities organically so that we become trusted community anchors. We'll then repeat that process again and again and again in each new market we enter as we scale nationwide. We have two beachhead markets in the Mid-Atlantic and Southern California regions, which have eight chamber chapters and millions of potential customers. There's no one really doing what we're doing. You may have heard of Folks or Plume. Both companies do absolutely fabulous work for transgender patients, but that only accounts for about 4% of the LGBTQ community. Here at Equality MD, we're the only company that requires evidence-based cultural competency training has an AI powered virtual first health tech platform that serves the entire LGBTQ community while generating new insights. Our existing relationships enable us to grow and scale faster and also present us with unique exit opportunities. Just recently, for example, United Health Group said that they were keenly interested in acquiring us because we allow them to help solve their problem of member attrition and member engagement. Payers are being given LGBTQ mandates and they see us as an authentic way to engage that patient population. We have our first health system customer, Cedar sinai They see Equality MD as a trust bridge between their health system and the massive LGBTQ population in Southern California. We've completed massive customer discovery, over 350 inpatient, in-person interviews as well as over 32,000 patient surveys nationwide. We really know our customer. On that note, we are the ideal team to meet the needs of our community because we have lived the problem we're solving and we have the skill sets to develop a scalable solution. Our ask is $1.2 million to continue building our main platform while simultaneously growing our go-to-market product. By the end of this year, we'll have our main platform complete and we'll have $400,000 in revenue from over 2,000 customers on our go-to-market product and be well positioned to break even by this time next year. While we can't do anything about those awful hospital gowns, we can empower the underserved LGBTQ community to become the superheroes of their own healthcare stories. Thank you for interest in our story. I look forward to talking with you in the back of the tables and answering any questions you may have or admiring my cool threads. But at this moment, I'd like you to introduce you to my friend, Peter. Peter is building an amazing health equity platform for another underserved community. But more importantly, he too has great taste in music. Uh, and unlike my culinary skills, which are downright scary, he is our resident gourmet chef of our healthcare class. Peter.
Hey everybody, my name is Peter Jongwe. I'm the founder and CEO of Open Health. Um, first, I'm really grateful for Halcyon for having me as a fellow, as uh, part of the first Health Tech uh, Fellowship, and really grateful that you showed up here on a rainy day. Um, but beyond that, at Open, we are working to improve access to care. And we're doing this by building the first, by building the operating system to deliver healthcare in non-traditional spaces, starting with barbershops and salons. The reason I started Oban is personal. Picture here is my brother, Paul. A couple of years ago, Paul passed away from uncontrolled hypertension at the age of 36 in his sleep. His death was completely preventable and should never have happened. Unfortunately, this is the reality for too many black and brown Americans in this country. Not only are we 32 times more likely to die from chronic diseases like hypertension, but over 44% have insufficient access to primary care. The Wall Street Journal just published a study that said 83.1 million Americans have insufficient access to primary care. Combine that with over one in five using the emergency department or, or missing preventative services, there's no doubt of why we have a prevalence in chronic disease conditions. But what's truly disheartening for me is that over 31% fear going to the doctor because they're afraid they're gonna be discriminated against. That should not be happening. And that's why, we're, that's why we're, what we're building at Oban is so important. Our vision is to bring care to where people are. We're starting by focusing on hypertension, which is the most prevailing chronic disease condition in this community. We're also working on upscaling barbers and stylists who are the trusted sources of uh, trusted source of knowledge in this community into clinical workforce, and we're using technology to facilitate care delivery. Why barbershops? Well, there's clinical evidence that suggests barbershops are 64% more effective than standards of care, i.e. meet the patient going to a clinic. And this was based on the 2018 LA study. But forget the clinical piece a little bit. We all know barbershops are community hubs. It's where we go, we spend time, it's where we have conversations, people go on a Saturday not to even get a cut. We argue who's the GOAT, Braun, Jordan, or Kobe. I mean, we all know what the answer is, but let's live, save that. Um, where we learn about the stock market. Just, uh, you know, minus all those little details, it's fundamentally a place of trust. And we've all heard about trust, and which is something that's so missing in our healthcare institutions today. And that's why we leverage barbershops. And what we do is we train and certify the barbers to be community health workers. They each get a blood pressure monitor where they're trained to screen their patients for blood pressure. They're also trained to provide health coaching and education. We actually deliver care in the barbershop. We just don't refer them because we know that actually creates gaps in care. People got to take time off work. There's just too many issues around that. And last but not the least, we have technology to strengthen this type of team-based care. So here's how it works. When a patient walks into an open certified barbershop, the barber screens them and says, hey, man, when's the last time you had your blood pressure taken? For a lot of our patients, it's been over two plus years. So they get screened. If they meet our threshold, they're enrolled into the program. At your next haircut visit, there's going to be a pharmacist or a PA that's going to provide care after that visit. There's one thing I can tell you about barbershops, you don't miss that visit. So that's our engagement goal there. But the third step is where the magic starts to happen is where we have the panel management that really essentially enables us to know which patient is gonna show up and how we coordinate care. So this is a brief overview of the technology where we ingest a lot of data whether it's from the provider, the patient data into our plot, the AI model we're building, and that's enabled to help them with care coordination, care management, uh, enables the barber to generate reports that they need so we know which patient is showing up and we can provide that data to the health systems and payers we're working with. Bringing this product to life is a phenomenal team. We know how to get this done. We have over 30 years of experience in this space. I've spent most of my life working as a software engineer, building platforms for technology companies like Shopify. My co-founder, Dr. Tam, was part, was a part of the, was, a, was an author on the barbershop study done in LA. So we know how to get this done. And we're a team of clinicians and technologies that are building this product. So far, we have 500 patients we're working with. We have over 17 barbershops, 35 barbers and stylists. We're working with two health plans and three providers, and we're on track to generate over $500,000 in revenue this year. 
And we have a partnership with UCSF and Stanford to train and certify our barbers. Our business model is simple. One, we sell to health plans and health systems. We charge them uh, 1500 to 3500 per patient per year. And we sell to them based on applicable CPT codes, a SaaS platform fee, and, general, and, and, safe, and cost savings. Our go-to-market is in four steps. When we enter a new market, we're currently focused on California. So we work with managed care organizations or health systems. Once we've identified the ones we need to work with, we identify areas of need based on high utilization rates, where patients are, or what gaps in care they want to close. We then find and partner with the barbers and salons in that space. And then we have the technology to start facilitating the care delivery and coordination that needs to happen. I'm excited to say standing today, we've closed our pre-seed run of $1.1 million, and which is gonna enable us to really build and scale the product we're doing. And, I, I, and we've been backed by tremendous investors like the American Heart Association, we believe in the work we're doing. And so just three things, I ask. If you're connected to any health payer or health systems, if you know of any community experts or you're interested in joining us. And the last bit would, if you have any, if you're a potential investor that's interested in participating in our seed realm. I wanna end with this. To this day, I am haunted by the simple fact that if Paul had gotten screened, he would still be alive. Help me ensure that no family has to go through the pain of losing a loved one like my family did. Thank you. And now I get the honor, the privilege to introduce my dear friend, um, who also happens to know the best dessert spot in <laughs> DC, in Georgetown. You should definitely talk to her after this. Uh, but beyond that, she, um, we also geek out on a lot of animes. She is, we both care about your heart. And she is just one of the smartest and phenomenal persons I've met. Please welcome Akshaya. Hi. Thank you so much, Peter, for your lovely introduction. Um, as Peter mentioned, I'm Akshaya, co-founder and CTO of Corian Health. We are bringing the cardiopulmonary exam into the homes of patients. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted how difficult it can be to get into the clinic and see your doctor. And while we are over the pandemic, many Americans still face barriers and find it difficult to access care. In a survey where we asked over 100 patients if they face any barriers, the majority of Americans face at least one significant barrier to accessing care. These barriers include cost, time, distrust, or just lack of available appointments. One in five Americans haven't seen a doctor in over five years, and they're missing out on the opportunity to get preventative screenings. This has a significant impact on the health of our communities. For example, heart disease is the number one killer, yet it is estimated that four in five heart-related deaths could have been prevented if we screened them early and managed the disease. While telehealth has gained a lot of popularity and has a great opportunity to address many of these barriers that people face, it is often still limiting. For example, physicians cannot reach through a computer screen and listen to the heart of their patients on the other side. And while we haven't figured out a way to transport a physician through a computer screen, we have found a way to enable patients to conduct basic heart and lung screenings on their own. We have taken the traditional stethoscope, which physicians have been using for over 200 years, and digitized it. We have made it into a simple device that can be easily used by patients. It has a microphone inside instead of the traditional earpieces so that patients can capture the sounds. It can connect to laptops, phones, and tablets via USB, and patients can place this directly on skin under their clothing. A blinking light on the back shines through the clothing and our computer vision algorithm can track its movement. A guided user interface takes the video image of a patient and shows them exactly where to place the device on their own body, as you can see with the red circle. When the patient navigates it to the correct location, 
the light turns green and the recording automatically begins. This process is repeated for four locations on the chest, which corresponds to four heart valve locations that physicians like to listen to as part of a basic heart health exam. This process can be conducted in under five minutes and is highly intuitive. And don't just trust my word for it. We conducted a pilot study with 20 community members and the results were very promising. Patients really enjoyed using our product and we're excited to be able to see this come um, to reality. While there are several other electronic stethoscopes in the market, we stand out in our patient experience and attention to their usability. This is reflected in our low cost minimalistic design, our attention to patient privacy, and the ability for patients to conduct this completely independently from the comfort and convenience of their home. Our interdisciplinary team brings together clinical, software, marketing, medical device, and regulatory expertise. Over the past two years, we have gotten lots of progress done. We have built our MVP and conducted pilot studies. We have filed our patent and secured partnerships and letters of intent worth over $1 million. We have raised $500,000 from various sources. And by various sources, I mean we've done it all. We've gone through several accelerators. We've raised from angels. We've won several pitch competitions. We had a successful crowdfunding campaign. And we have been awarded a prestigious foundational investment. Several different people are very excited to invest and support us. We are seeking an additional $1.4 million to accelerate our pathway through FDA clearance and enter the market in early 2025. We will enter the market through our strategic partnership with a large pediatric telemedicine company. And we will use this opportunity to refine our product and then grow and expand our business. We aim to position ourselves as the leader in patient-centric medical devices an um, exciting market that is valued at over $407 billion. At Corion, we believe that healthcare should be simple to access, and we'd love to talk to you more about how we are putting healthcare in the palms of patients' hands. Thank you so much. I'd like to take this time to now introduce William, who has constantly inspired me by his work ethic and dedication to the company and by how fast he can cut, like speed up through all the stairs in this really large house without being winded. Good afternoon, everybody. It's such an honor for me to be part of this program. Um, this place brings a lot of memories. My dad lived here in DC a couple of years ago. Uh, I've come here, visited here a couple of times. Uh, unfortunately, there's good and bad memories. Uh, the good memories that I really enjoyed it here, but the bad memories that he also passed away here. So, you know, it's such an honor for me to be here. Anyways, let's get to business. <clears throat> Africa bears a quarter of a global disease burden, but telehealth penetration rate is below 1%. This stark contrast highlights not just the pressing healthcare uh, crisis on ground, but also a significant and an untapped opportunity uh, for a significant change that uh, is also shown by the exploding growth of other tech sectors that like the free tech and e-commerce that have grown and achieved more than 40% growth uh, in the last three years. We believe we have the capacity to lead this market. In comparison, it's evident that while America and Europe um, 
grapple with disparities and inefficiencies in their advanced healthcare system. Africa faces a more fundamental challenge with infrastructure, uh, professional uh, shortages, as well as critical lack of access. To put this into context, imagine spending eight agonizing days just to book a simple doctor's appointment, only to end up with a permanent disability due to delayed medical intervention. It's hard to believe, but this is my mother's story. And this affects more than 80 million patients each year in the continent. This is why we started Life Plus. Life Plus, ladies and gentlemen, is the first registered telemedicine provider in Tanzania with more than 420 uh, healthcare connectivity clusters bringing important medical services in one platform. A comprehensive telemedicine platform integrates virtual physician consultation, medical testing, and e-prescription, allowing patients to access essential health services instantly and conveniently. What sets us apart is our vast connectivity clusters with various uh, partner healthcare providers. This allows us to offer continuity of care to patients throughout their ailment while improving uh, better accessibility with both online and offline touch points. So now, what is the... What are the indicators in the market that suggest this growing opportunity waiting to be tapped into? Well, first, uh, there's a rapid and exponential growth of mobile and internet penetration rate uh, of 46%, uh, which means that patients are now able to use uh, 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 mobile devices to access teleconsultation and other telehealth services. Uh, there's a triple, uh, there's a, a, a significant growth, which is three times of the middle class, presents a huge customer base of, of customers that are now able to uh, afford services and products that they were not able to afford before. And reports by the Ministry of Health suggest that at least 20%, there's about 20% of patients that have used telehealth consultation before, which means, which shows a significant customer behavioral change uh, uh, and the ability of patients to adapt to telehealth consultations. Thank you a lot. Appreciate it. Um, yes, so by the reports of the Ministry of Health, uh, they've highlighted that there's at least 20% of patients that have ever used telehealth consult uh, services in their past. And this highlights the uh, a significant customer behavioral change in the market, uh, which suggests the growth of the market size. We're uniquely positioned to lead in this market. This is why. First, we're first to market, and being the first mover in the market means that we're able uh, to build brand loyalty to our customers uh, before any other entrant. We are working with regulators, policymakers, <clears throat> to make sure uh, to develop policies that will later uh, uh, regulate other telehealth uh, providers in the market. We've secured partnership with the Medical Association of Tanzania, which is an umbrella association of all medical professionals in the country uh, with more than 3,000 medical doctors. This ensures us an adequate supply of uh, medical professionals to work with upon scale. We have the most number of health care providers and uh, uh, specialist doctors in the country, which solidifies our market, uh, our leading uh, position in the market. We've also acquired uh, We've also gained uh, attention from other parts of the continent. And recently we've been approached by the Senegalese market uh, government to scale to Senegal. So currently we're finalizing uh, 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 our pilot plans 
with the principal hospital in Dakar, Senegal. And this will inform our market entry strategy to the West Africa Francophone market. What is our traction to date? We've been able to onboard 387 doctors and uh, 41 health facility partnerships across Tanzania. And this allows us to facilitate more than 1,200 appointments monthly, generating $11,200 of monthly recurring revenues. We're profitable. Last year, we made an outstanding 140% growth in revenues, facilitating over 14,200 appointments and over 36,000 medical tests. We're seeking to raise 500,000 US dollars in equity to expand our customer acquisition operations on board more uh, healthcare providers and complete our pilot project with the principal hospital in Dakar uh, as we look to scale to West Africa. Our team comprises of experts in the medical field, technology, as well as business. And with more than three years into the business, the team has shown capacity to execute the company's vision and achieve our goals. My name is William Mduma. I'm a chemist professional with more than six, uh, eight years experience in the medical field. And together we bring more than 32 years of collective experience. Investing in Life Plus isn't just investing in a profitable business prospect, but it's investing in the future where patients have the power to make decisions about their health without being limited to access or costs. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. I'm not usually the one that pitches, but I really, really appreciate it. So I'd like to welcome one of my dearest friends that I've you know, gotten to know here at Halcyon. Uh, one of the things that I absolutely adore about him is that we share so many tests in food. Uh, he's from Uganda. Uh, he's an incredible person. I've gotten to you know, adore for some time now. Please welcome uh, Brian from Uganda. Thank you. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian Piawaji, and I'm the CEO and co-founder at Mugot Medicals. While at the university, my friend Olivia lost her grandmother. And the tragedy is that she had been taken across six different health centers, which all misdiagnosed her condition. And you might be wondering, because this issue is even much more worse for children aged below five years. For example, in Uganda, Pneumonia is the second leading cause of hospital admissions and death among children below the age of five. And it also accounts for over 14% of all the child death within that space. And the question is, why does it happen? Why is it so big? Well, here to tell you that the diagnosis and screening of pneumonia remains a complicated issue because of the clinical skills variability across different clinics and environment. And because of that, there's always delayed access to treatment, which then arises out of the expensive and unnecessary hospital referrals. So as students of engineering, we wondered ourselves, what could we do about this kind of issue which was happening? So we sat down and designed and came up with an non-invasive product that can then enhance the clinician abilities while screening for pneumonia, especially in the rural settings. And how it works is that the doctor can just get it into their hands. It fits onto the chest of the child while they're diagnosing them. Then it's able to communicate with the mobile phone application, which helps in the visualization of the screening outcomes. And that way, we are able to help the clinicians in giving them a calibrated and specific screening outcome. You could be curious about our target market. Well, the Ugandan market has over 7,000 healthcare facilities. And these are split between the private and the public health markets. Our focus would be on the larger share of the private for-profit segment. And that's because they simply have less internal regulation and increased flexibility with their budgets. But this kind of is not only specific to Uganda, but even other neighboring economies, such as Tanzania with over 4,000 different facilities, Kenya with over 600,000 different facilities, and Nigeria with over 13,000 different facilities, all the same, which present to us an expansion opportunity for, kind, for our kind of work. And if each of these clinics just buys two devices from our company, we are able to make a revenue estimate of 500,000 US dollars within our launch year. And to the clinics, 
it presents a unique pneumonia screening opportunity, which is then able to earn them additional revenues from the clinical examinations. We've been iterating through our work. And as you can see there, from 2021, we were able to make our initial prototypes, which we tested on the different children and the users. This was also bench tested in 2022 in a lab and as well a bench test reports. And last year, we were able to conduct a clinical pilot among five hospitals on over 120 children. And because of that, our product is now a candidate product for the NEST 360 program, which is conducted on behalf of the UNICEF team. This year, we were on our track to get a certification and a market clearance so that we can start our work into the market. And I'm happy to announce that we've also been able to schedule our first pre-submission meeting with the FDA, something that will help us, first of all, in answering the local market expectations, but also position ourselves to easily scale into the neighboring markets later. We are planning to launch into the market in the coming year, 2025. All this work has been engineered and done by a qualified team of different experts. But we've also made clear partnerships, which are critical and position us for bigger scale, such as our partnership with Dr. Data Santorino, who is the country lead of Comtech Uganda, and as well other individuals who work within ecosystems, such as GE Healthcare, Google Africa, and the Health Innovation Exchange, that are willing to support us through our work. Not only that, we've also been supported by big organizations that are critical in supporting the kind of work that we're doing, such as the accelerators, the funding partners, and the market validation partners. Our ask is half a million US dollars, which should be helping us to do the product launch within our beachhead market, and as well help us into scaling into the neighboring markets later, but plus helps us into getting more distribution channels across and along the way. You can support us through the FDA clearance process, being our manufacturing partner, and as well helping us access more funding. You can connect with me using that QR code. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I have the honor of introducing the person who is coming next. Yeah, her name simply means to be enlightened. So if you needed more enlightenment today, she is here to help you do that. Thank you. Welcome with me, Abhishri. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all about how MediMint is transforming the future of medical image sharing. My name is Abhishek Ramesh. I am a current medical student at the George Washington School of Medicine, and I've been a radiology research fellow for the past couple of years. And I'd like to start this pitch off with a true patient story that I encountered. So a couple years ago, Maria came in for her mammogram, but her providers did not have access to her prior medical images. So because of this, her providers were left to use their best clinical judgment regarding a diagnosis of breast cancer and they collectively decided that it looked like Maria was in the clear. So Maria, believing that she was healthy, did not get another mammogram for over five years. Now at this point, not only did Maria discover that she did have breast cancer, but she also found out that her previous providers had left her undiagnosed because they did not have access to her complete medical imaging history. So I wish I could say that stories like Maria's are isolated incidents, but as a medical student, I can tell you that they're definitely not. I run into stories like Maria's almost every day. And it really stems from the fact that current medical image sharing practices are just outdated and inefficient. Over 85% of healthcare organizations today still utilize CDs and DVDs to transfer medical images. And it's a process that costs imaging centers. It leads to delays in care. And it contributes to an over $30 billion healthcare burden for repeat imaging. And it's not just us that thinks, that thinks this is an issue. There are articles that come out almost every month about how current medical image sharing practices just need to change from prominent healthcare organizations. And as part of the National Science Foundation, iCore program, I conducted over 200 customer discovery interviews to really nail down why in 2024 are we still using CDs and DVDs to transfer medical images? And it really came down to these three reasons, interoperability, cost, and security. The current platforms out there only allow medical imaging institutions utilizing the same platform to transfer medical images. 
They're also prohibitively costly, leaving out the majority of outpatient and freestanding imaging centers, and they lack security posture, as evident by the market leader in this field, Nuance PowerShirt, getting hacked just over a month ago. So this is where MediMint comes in. We are a B2B medical image sharing platform that facilitates secure and seamless medical image sharing between providers and patients, as well as providers to other providers. And we're blockchain enabled. So we're taking advantage of the inherent architecture of blockchain to provide providers with the features that they care about, including interoperability, cost, and security. And the way that we're doing that is we have a public ledger, which means that any healthcare or medical imaging institution can tap into the network. We don't have a middleman, which makes this infrastructure light and cost efficient. And we distribute access controls over multiple nodes. So we don't have a single point of vulnerability that can be exploited by hackers. In a controlled simulation study at the George Washington School of Medicine, we were project projected to lower medical image sharing costs by 40%, increase patient retention by 12%, as well as improve workflow efficiency by over 30%. So we're targeting US outpatient medical imaging centers, and we're focusing on the Southeast based on our industry connections. And we're looking to expand to all imaging facilities, which presents us with a $9 billion opportunity. We have a very simple B2B tiered pricing model based on the volume of medical images that are shared by the institution. And because of our inherent architecture, we're able to offer our solution at a 66% cheaper price point than our competitors. As I briefly mentioned before, no competitors out there currently address security, interoperability, and cloud and costs, which is why cloud-enabled solutions face limited adoption, with less than 10% of medical imaging facilities currently utilizing them. Now, the blockchain-enabled solutions, they're looking to tackle medical records as a whole. But their inherent architecture makes it infeasible to tackle the large file sizes of medical images. And DVDs and CDs just need to be a thing of the past. In terms of our five-year customer accusation and growth plan, we have pilot partnerships in place with three medical imaging institutions. And we're looking to grow using our customer accusation strategy, which includes published case studies, using our spheres of influence, into medical conferences as well as word of mouth referrals in order to hit our five year 37 million ARR target. We have a founding team at the intersection of healthcare and blockchain. I am a current medical student and I spent the last couple of years as a radiology research fellow. Ava is a current Wharton MBA candidate and she spent the last couple of years building blockchain solutions and bringing them to Intersection Markets as the director of product at Salesforce. And Kelly has over 20 years of digital transformation. We, have, we also have a very strong advisory team, including the Chief Medical Information Officer of Mental Care Health, who's serving as a product evangelist and looking to evangelize this solution across their healthcare networks. So we're moving fast. We actually started measurement less than a year ago, and we've already developed our product, iterated on our product, as well as demoed and tested our product with over 20 healthcare providers. And we're getting geared up for our pilot launch, which we're hoping to start in just a couple months, after which we will be raising a pre-seed round. So what we're looking for right now are introductions to healthcare design and deployment partners as we get ready for our pilot launch, as well as introductions to pre-seed investors that would be interested in participating in our pre-seed round. So I'd like to end this pitch with just taking a second to look like how Maria's story would have changed with anyway. Maria would have been able to arrive for her mammogram, and her or her providers would have been able to request her prior medical images in just a few clicks. She would have been diagnosed with breast cancer on that day and before it had progressed to a critical stage. Thank you all for the time and opportunity to present to you all. I'm looking forward to speak to all of you guys at the tables and thank you all. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce the next healthcare fellow, Amber to say that he is one of the kindest and most intelligent people that I have ever known would be an understatement. And I know that everyone in the cohort can agree because we're all fighting for his attention. So I know <laughs> that I personally learned a lot from him and I'm excited for all of you guys to learn a lot from him as well. Well, thanks so much, Abhishri.
My name is Amber Nigam, and I'm very excited to be a part of Halcyon family, and I'm excited to be presenting my company here. So we at BASIS streamline a process called prior authorization for health systems and health plans. And I would explain as I go into details later what prior authorization is, but I would like to begin with a story. Imagine a person that has multiple chronic conditions. When this person goes to a hospital, a health system, they're prescribed a battery of tests, many of which are unnecessary and with several delays in between them. Yet the patient outcomes are bad. Doctors are overburdened and insurance companies do not have clarity on how money is being spent. We spent $4 trillion in healthcare, which is 20% of our entire GDP. Loosely speaking, people service could be attributable to this bad scheme of things. But what if we reverse the system? What if we made it more patient-centric? What if we focus on a value-based care? There are a few bottlenecks to that. And one of the processes that is a significant bottleneck is prior authorization. So let's begin with understanding what prior authorization is. Prior authorization is a process when a doctor has to take approval from insurance companies before prescribing a medication or a surgery. Right now, the process is quite manual. It takes a lot of time. It's done using phone calls and faxes. But come basis, we not only streamlined prior authorization, we also use artificial intelligence and machine learning to derive patterns from the data. Our product has three components. One on the health insurance side, where we ingest all the payer policies without inquiring human intervention. Second, on the provider or the health system side, where we understand how a patient is progressing from one disease stage to the other. And the third, which brings both the subjective information and tries to authorize a prior authorization. If I have to think about what is the strategic differentiation that BASIS has, I would say it's our ability to kind of ingest all the information that we have. For example, we have ingested more than 1 billion policy combinations on the insurance company side. We have also ingested 10 million patient data for the past five years, thanks to one of our investors and partners, Mayo Clinic, and we have also ingested a lot of drug level data, thanks to again, another of our investors that is Lily, Eli Lilly. And now based on this, what we do is we reduce administrative burden. At the same time, we try to make sure the care is delivered as soon as it can be. Digging a bit deeper, we resolve prior authorization based on the complexity of the request. So for example, if it's a simple request, we do not reinvent the wheel. We use a simple decision table or a decision for us. But in case of more nuanced requests, we use machine learning, deep learning, or natural language processing to resolve the request. But even in cases when we cannot resolve the request entirely, we can still annotate the documents so that the providers and payers do not have to spend a lot of time. We have also been integrated not on the provider side, the health system side, but we are also integrated with the health payer side, that is the health insurance companies. We have been working with amazing partners in terms of health plans and even health systems. We have filed a patent on the work that we have been doing. And these are some of the numbers that we have been able to achieve. It's not just a time saving, it's also a significant cost savings, not just for health systems, health plans, but also for the members, the patients. Most of our decision making is explainable, unlike many other AI-based systems. And we are more than 98% accurate, which speaks volume of the work that my team has done. I am supported by an amazing team. My co-founder has 12 years of experience in healthcare, she was also in pharma, and most recently she was working with Mass General Brigham and the Inner Cancer Institute. I, on the other hand, have founded and executed a company 
I've instructed at MIT and I filed three patents. These are some of our investors that include Mayo Clinic, Eli Lilly, and some of the traditional investors as well. So join me in redefining the healthcare, simplifying the processes like prior authorization. Thank you. And at this moment, I would love to introduce one of my dear friends, who is an amazing person, a great cook, a great chef. She would like to call herself a sous chef because Peter is so good. <laughs> but let me let me introduce you to Carol from Asana Health. So the good news is I'm the last founder presenting. <laughs> The bad news is I'm the last founder presenting. So you can imagine this is a very bittersweet moment for all of us founders. Uh, we're not looking forward to saying goodbye to this magical community and the people here. So uh, we're hoping there's a lot of Kleenex around the house over the next few days. I'm Dr. Carol Spengler Vaughn. I'm the founder and CEO of Isana. In 2017, I was diagnosed with stage 2B breast cancer. What that means is it had already advanced to my lymph nodes. I can tell you my world came to a crashing end. I, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. And really all I could think about was leaving my children without their mother. You might be a little surprised at that reaction when you find out about my background. So I have a PhD in biophysics from the Johns Hopkins. I have an MBA from the University of Washington. I've spent decades bringing products to market, mostly in the field of oncology. But with all that experience and knowledge, I was not prepared to be a patient. When you hear chemotherapy, most people think about hair loss and nausea and vomiting. You can see those. They're pretty awful, but they are temporary. We're going to talk about something today that isn't temporary and not something people talk about a lot. Many common chemotherapy drugs go into your blood. They make their way out to your fingers and toes and they destroy those sensitive nerve endings. That ends up in permanent nerve damage. The symptoms range from loss of feeling, tingling, um, when you can't feel the ground, you tend to fall more. More advanced cases deal with excruciating pain. So not only does this significant impact, significantly impact quality of life for these patients, but payers are paying an average of $17,000 per year, per patient, just trying to help them deal with the symptoms and get through the day. I can tell you when I had cancer, I did not want that nerve damage. I did some research and I found out that something as simple as cooling your hands and feet on the day of chemotherapy can prevent it. The idea is pretty straightforward. If you cool your hands and feet, the blood vessels constrict, making it more difficult for that drug to get out to your fingers and toes. Being a healthcare innovator, I was positive there would be a great device for me to use to, to do this, and I found out I was incorrect. The things that are available are really meant for, um, you know, twisting your ankle, post-op pain, so 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, ice cold. What a cancer patient needs to do is cool for six to eight hours while that drug is at a high concentration in their body, and you have to cool continuously. You also don't need ice cold. So since nothing existed, I found it, I saw it to solve that problem to meet this very special need for cancer patients. So the two things that you really need to do is you need to be able to be mobile. You need to be able to go home. You need to be able to walk to the bathroom, walk to the kitchen while you're cooling. You also need to use your hands. So we have very sleek gloves. We're working with a technical apparel designer. The sleek gloves allow patients, you can even type on your keyboard while you're cooling. The booties are like slippers. You can safely walk in them. And the tubing is all coordinated in a really nice warm uh, throw blanket, which really helps the patient experience be simple, respectful, and comfortable. So there are no other companies that are doing this. There's a couple companies that are coming up with solutions really based on short-term cooling, but we are the only company that has a product that patients can cool and easily get home and also use their hands and feet. We're actively pursuing patent protection in eight countries and the EU. 
And we did some independent qualitative market research, and we learned that most clinics are not interested in buying capital equipment, nor do they have the resources to lease devices out to patients. So to penetrate the market, we need to do direct to consumer. And fortunately or unfortunately, cancer patients are very well organized. They are in online support groups. I'm in a number of them. It's interesting to me to watch all the discussions that go on about patients asking for help. How do I keep my hands and feet cool during chemotherapy? Um, so everybody knows about this and everybody's struggling with it. Uh, cancer patients also end up at cancer centers, so we can find them there. I'll add one more thing about cancer patients. They're very motivated. If you tell us that we need to do something to improve survivorship and improve quality of life, we're going to do it. Initially, we'll launch a self-pay. The cost to the uh, patient will be $300 a month. We're going to use that revenue then to expand market access, mainly through reimbursement. Because we're a leased model, we have healthy profits of 79%. And just to give you a sense of how many patients we're talking about, in the U.S., we have about a million chemo patients each year. In 2022, we raised a $900,000 pre-seed round. We did a good bit of de-risking, developed a prototype, which we took to a, a wonderful focus group of oncology nurses at Houston Methodist. We took all that information and designed our next prototype, which we will be picking up next week, driving down to Houston to put on breast cancer patients at MD Anderson for a usability study. That information will allow us to finalize our design and launch product in 2025. I mentioned we will take those early revenues to fund a larger study so we can get reimbursement. I also want to point out that in uh, last year, we received a $400,000 phase one SBIR from the National Cancer Institute. Since I have so many years of experience in the industry, and I know a lot of really smart people, I've been able to sort of cherry pick people I know can get the job done. These are sort of the inner circle working on finance, clinical, and engineering. We're supported by an equally amazing group of advisors and consultants. We do have a full staffing plan and, um, ready to go based on our strategy and access to capital. We're raising 1.5 million as a standard convertible note round. We have a little over 500,000 of that in. This money will get us to revenue. And most of that, the three major categories are engineering, manufacturing, and clinical. We are ISANA. We are preventing nerve damage from chemotherapy. I would love to talk to you if you're interested in investing or strategically partnering with us. Thank you so much. So I have the pleasure of introducing Adam. Adam Kaplan has been our project manager here at Halcyon. So behind the scenes, he's been working really hard, making sure we have great programming. We've had amazing speakers. Each one would come in and I'd say they can't really get better. And they kind of did. So that was, I don't know how y'all did that. But the other thing he had to do was heard all of the founders. I had to make sure we were in the right place at the right time. And I can tell you that wasn't always easy, but he did it brilliantly. So, Adam. And thank you all the fellows for your inspiring presentations today. Everyone at Halcyon has learned so much from all of you about innovations in health tech, the communities you design these innovations to serve, and the resilience of the founders who work so much and sacrifice so much to bring this all to life. Can we please get a round of applause for all the presentations? So as Kyle said, I'm Adam. I've had the distinct privilege of managing this fellowship and this program. And as we enter Halcyon's 10th year, we've revamped our fellowships around three themes that we believe are key to the future of our society, health, climate and equity tech. That makes, as you've heard, that makes this Halcyon's first ever exclusively health-focused cohort. And we're excited to deepen our network in the DC health community as we commit to running this fellowship every year. To that point, I wanna thank Dr. Ainsley McLean and Dr. Peggy Hamburg for sharing your wealth of experience with us today. And your insights really help us to better understand the future, the current and future state of healthcare that these fellows and so many others are working to transform. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Deloitte, and Amazon Web Services, 
for all the support you provided to these fellows and to Halcyon as a whole. Thanks as well, as Carol mentioned, to the advisors, presenters, and coaches that have imparted so much knowledge and experience on a range of topics to our fellows to help make them stronger leaders and entrepreneurs. I also need to thank our small but mighty Halcyon team, as every single person here plays an important role in making all these programs a success. The selections team, who identifies entrepreneurs that are going to make great Halcyon fellows, the development team who builds the invaluable relationships that match like-minded funders with our programs, our newly designed programs as Halcyon continues to evolve. The communications team that captures and amplifies the stories of these fellows while they're here at Halcyon and once they leave. The events team who enables showcases like this one to happen. And of course the programs team for the hands-on work you do every day with our fellows to help them achieve their goals. I especially want to thank Emily Owen for her exceptional work in planning and executing this program with me. And I also want to thank our president and CEO, sorry, Dan, Dan Barker, for your creative and compassionate leadership that will propel Halcyon for the next 10 years. Have you heard this is our 10-year anniversary? On the top of every slide, you're going to keep hearing about it more throughout 2024, so get ready. To that point, our Climate Fellowship begins in May, and if you're interested in collaborating on that program, please come and talk to me or Emily or someone else on the team to learn more about it. Also applications for our Equity Tech Fellowship open on April 15th. So if you know founders whose businesses are working to close a crucial access gap in a particular market, please encourage them to apply or talk to us. There's something uniquely special about a residential incubator where individuals from different parts of the world get to live together, learn together and support each other day after day for several months. At breakfast a couple of weeks ago, one of the fellows remarked on the immense value that she's found in these unexpected conversations when she runs into other fellows around this fantastic house. Someone across the table referred to them as creative collisions, which I jotted down because it really is consistent with the serendipity that I've observed happening constantly around housing with fellows, with people who just come to visit the house for meetings. Um, and I really took that with me. And I've watched over these eight weeks as those creative collisions in this group have morphed into family-like bonds that have given rise to new traditions like Wine Down Wednesday and Sunday dinner and even a murder mystery adventure last week. I'm grateful for getting to witness these connections take root and take shape um, and getting to witness these meaningful connections that you've all built together while here that I know you're going to take with you well after you leave. So now I'd like to invite you all to the back of this beautiful room to create your own creative collisions with the fellows, the Halcyon team and each other. Thank you so much for coming and enjoy the rest of the event.